It has been a rough couple of weeks, months, years for the company FortiGate. Uh, hackers leak configs and VPN credentials for 15,000 FortiGate devices. A new hacking group has leaked the configuration files and IP addresses and VPN credentials for over 15,000 FortiGate devices for free on the dark web. If you're asking why I don't use ad blocker, it's because I actually make money from ads. I feel like it's kind of unethical for me to use an ad blocker, but that's irrelevant to this video. Uh, the posting here shows a, uh, a list of all the compromised IP addresses in a 1.6 gigabyte archive that shows the IP addresses as well as configs and even private keys for these devices. Also, if you're new here, hi, my name is Ed. This is Low Level TV, a channel where I make videos about software security, cybersecurity, CVEs, hacking, all that cool stuff. I'm actually a security engineer and offensive security specialist in my day job. So if you're into that kind of stuff or just wanna hang out with me, hit that sub button. I really appreciate it, thank you. How did we get here? What, what, what enabled these hackers to get into these devices? If you don't know who Fortinet is, Fortinet is a company that makes a variety of security products. They're a company based in the US. They're, they're big. Their big device is this thing called the, the Next Generation Firewall, the NGFW. You can buy this in a physical form factor like this. We're not gonna watch the whole video, but I'll show you kind of like what the, the thing looks like physically. It's your traditional rack mount system. And inside of it are a variety of different processors, right? You have your network processor. It's an ASIC and application specific integrated circuit for you know forwarding network traffic. You have a content processor. So it's able to inspect the contents automatically and look for malicious stuff. And then security processor, it'll apply security rules. Not an ad, obviously, I don't, I'm not sponsored by that. I'm just showing you kind of uh, what's going on here. But there's been a series of vulnerabilities in these devices that are a little wild uh, that for some reason go unpatched. All devices in these hacks were equipped with 40 OS, which is the, the version of the firmware that runs on these devices, 700 or 706 or 720 up to 722. Now, if you go back to 2022, uh, there was a pretty crazy CVE where there was a critical auth bypass in these Fortinet firewalls that allowed you to forward packets to the other side of the firewall and then as admin do something. We actually have the proof of concept by a company called Horizon 3 AI, not actually an AI company, I think, they just do security research with AI in the name. But what they do is via this script, they're able to add arbitrarily an SSH public key to the Fortinet firewall and then SSH to the firewall with the private key. How how does that work? That sounds like a critical oversight in, uh, in security architecture. If you look at this proof of concept that they're using here, they go to an API URL, there's a command buffer, and then you can do system admin via some username, and the username, it, you just have to know a single username on the firewall, and obviously any firewall is gonna have likely an admin user or a root user, right? The way that this vulnerability works is extremely interesting because what you're able to do is add this forwarded header. There is a lot of interesting architecture inside of devices that have multiple ends, right? If you have like the WAN side of a firewall and like the admin plane and then like the user plane and the data plane, there's typically a lot of IPC inter-process communication that allows you to send packets from one layer to another. And the details of how that works and the auth behind how all that works, extremely very, very sensitive and hard to get right. And if you get it wrong, uh, you have bugs like this, where you can say, hey, by the way, listen, listen, I know this packet is unauthenticated, but don't worry, um, it's destined for this IP address and this port, and it came from this IP address and this port. Don't worry about it, it's fine, right? So what they're doing effectively is re-implementing layer three data, right, IP data, source IP, dest IP, and they're implementing it for some reason in like a layer seven part of the protocol in an H HTTP header, and because there is no logic to check for whether or not this is actually true, they don't validate that this matches the layer three contents, the actual IP address, it just says, oh, it's a packet internal to the device, and we don't validate the authentication of internal packets. You can just do whatever you want, and so you're able to arbitrarily add an SSH public key. Now, for this vulnerability to be useful, obviously it requires the firewall to have SSH open, right, exposed to the internet, but that's incredibly common, right? When you have firewalls, typically the only thing you're gonna leave exposed anywhere is going to be some kind of administrative plane, right? Some kind of administrative access you need credentials to get into. And with these firewalls, typically they have kind of like a login page. Let's see if I can get a screenshot for one of those. Something like this, nothing too crazy going on here, just like your traditional login and password. And the idea, the security here, the, the threat model for anyone who's deploying these next generation firewalls is like, oh, okay, well, you can only get into this device and do malicious things if I know the username and password. 
Okay, well, the problem with any system that has authentication is that the authentication is code. And like anything that I've said, you've, you've seen my videos before, code can have vulnerabilities. This also isn't the first time this has happened, by the way. There was a similar incident that happened in 2021 using a 2018 vulnerability. So kind of like the exact same math here, right? 2025, 2022 vulnerability, 2021 with a 2018 vulnerability. The, the fact that firewall owners uh, don't update their firewalls is crazy to me. Uh, but we can see the exact same pattern happening here. Hackers leak passwords for 500,000 Fortinet VPN accounts. Fortinet credentials leaked on a hacking forum. The list of Fortinet credentials was leaked for free by a threat actor known as Orange, who is the administrator of the newly launched Ramp hacking forum and a previous operator of the Babook ransomware operation. After disputes occurred between members of the Babook gang, Orange split off the start Ramp and is now believed to be the representative uh, of the new Groove ransomware operation. I do find the inner politics of like these hacking groups, like there was Gro there's Babook and then Groove and then Orange got mad at Babook. So now there's like, it's just, it's kind of funny. It's like, it's like, like, I guess, internet gang warfare. I don't know. Anyway, so they did leak a, again, 500,000 credentials to Fortinet VPN endpoints using a vulnerability from 2018. So the, the bug used in this attack uh, was actually one of several found by vulnerability researcher Orin Sai. I don't know if you've ever heard of any of their work, but they do some pretty crazy bug hunting they've presented at Black Hat, at DEF CON. Uh, but the, the, the bugs that they found in this vulnerability research are just some of the most embarrassing and some of them like malicious uh, that I've ever seen. So the first one, and this is what they actually used in the proof of concept here, where you can arbitrarily get the password for the SSL VPN for a Fortinet device for 2018, 13, 7, 9 is, uh, an arbitrary file reading pre-authentication. So this is your traditional, it's called directory traversal. And normally when you do directory traversals, you use like the dot dot slash, right? So you say like the URL for the thing you wanna to go to, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, whatever. And obviously any sane HTTP server will, will filter for that. But this one's a little more interesting, right? There's specific code inside the server that looks for a corresponding language file when you try to access something on the device, right? And so the way that it does this is it takes the current language that you have the device set to and then SN printf's that into this buffer here and then goes and retrieves that file. Okay, so what if instead of that, we put <laughs> dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash et cetera into the language that we're talking about, it'll SN printf that into the buffer and then from there we have arbitrary file reading. And then so from there, what they're able to do with that is use that to read a device file called dev command B SSL web VPN web session, which will literally just dump the raw RAM of the web session. And you're able to use that to reveal the contents of the web session, which therefore has the password in plain text. Not sure how that is possible or like is sane at all that you just get, you know, raw access to the password here through access of that file. Uh, but yeah, see, they did the thing here where you put the language equal to dot dot slash 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 slash. You have to pad it out to uh, 40 bytes. Otherwise, you'll get the lang at the end and that won't that work. So you pad it out to 40 bytes and then you put dev command B SSL VPN web session and you can just dump the memory out of that, which will get you the password to the web session, which is crazy. In this paper, they go into how they use that ability to get the SSL VPN contents. They forward a connection through to the HTTP server, and then they eventually take over the firewall via heap overflow. This exploit's very complicated. I won't bore you with the details of it in this video, but the more interesting one, in my opinion, is this magical back door, where in the login page, we found a special parameter called magic. Once a parameter meets a hard-coded string, we can modify any user's password. I even found a fun little video. They log into the to the firewall as a test account. It'll show us the uh, the test account's username and password. So here we go. We got test user. Great. And then the password one two three four five or whatever. Great. They log in. No questions there. But they go back. They log out. And then via this script with no credentials, just the name of the user, they can set the password to POC and they log into the user or the firewall as test user with POC. Oh, with no questions asked. I've made a lot of content on this channel where I talk about how certain vulnerabilities can potentially be backdoors and potentially be malicious. Guys, this is literally a backdoor. Like, like literally a vulnerability that is intentionally installed by the manufacturer. And I guess they just thought, 
there's no problems with this. No one will be able to open up a binary in Ghidra to do a strings analysis to figure out if there are any weird strings in the binary and then do cross references to figure out what functions you have to call to get to that weird string. No one can do that. Absolutely insane behavior. The, the moral of the story, you know, Fortinet not looking super great. Again, you know, use them if you want to. I can't say if you should or shouldn't, but these leaks have been a little wild. And just this, this bug here, we're talking about like 2009 behavior, right? Oh, we put a magic value there. And if you get it right, we just, you can change the password, that's fine. Oh, we have to do my favorite part of the video. Guys, we have to do my favorite part. Would Rust have solved these vulnerabilities? The drum roll, please. Rust would not have solved this. This is a logic issue, right? This is a misimplementation of a filter that Rust would not have caught. Pre-auth, cross-site scripting. Nope, Rust would not have caught this. This is a failure to sanitize the inputs into a particular buffer before they go get written out as JavaScript. Pre-auth heap overflow. So this is the only bug in this list that Rust would have actually caught. Basically, they do a len check here minus the index of a string, but they're adding five to it if it meets these characters. And so because of that, you can index outside of the buffer. The bounds checking would have caught this and eventually they do a mem copy. And if you write outside of that buffer, it also would have caught that. But the, the magical backdoor? No, dude, that's not a bug. That's a feature. Rust would have no problem letting you compile this into the code. So yeah, it's just crazy behavior on their part. The TLDR, if you are Using Fortinet devices, I would highly recommend you go and not only update your firmware, but you could be one of the compromised here or one of the compromised here. Granted, this was three years ago at this point. Make sure you're changing your passwords, otherwise the orange or ramp or babook or groove may be taking control of your devices. If you guys like these kinds of videos, do me a favor, let me know in the comments below if you enjoy the CVE breakdowns, the intrusion breakdowns, and then go check out this other video about a similar intrusion that I think you will enjoy just as much. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I really do appreciate it. Goodbye.